So welcome everyone. Um, this is the Kentan, um, Kenmore West and Kenmore East financial aid night. Um, so glad you all could make it and it'll be a great presentation tonight. Katie Coxis is the director of financial aid at Niagara University. So we're really grateful that she is joining us tonight um, to offer her expertise um, on this subject. And before she starts, um, Matt Corlay, one of the other counselors from Kenmore West, is going to give a little, a little bit of information about another program we have. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our financial aid night. Um, we just wanted to um, share with you a uh, FAFSA initiative completion that we are sponsoring at the Family Support Center. Um, we've got the information right here, and um, we're going to be starting October 19th. We'll work on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, we'll have two appointments a week, or I'm sorry, per day, 5.30 and 7. Um, if you'd like to uh, take advantage of that, we've got the phone number here. Just call the family support number and they will schedule you at a convenient time. And during the sessions, what we'll do is we'll complete the FAFSA. We'll help you out with completing the FAFSA and the TAP form. So when you leave that night, you'll have everything complete. So again, um, we hope you take advantage of that. We did it last year. Uh, it went really well, um, but if you have any questions, call us at West or um, schedule that appointment at the Family Support Center. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to get out of this and go into mine. Um, beginning. And we will share. Submit one more person. Okay, um, welcome everyone. Can everyone hopefully see my screen? Give me a thumbs up. Hopefully. Um, okay. Um, oh, this is the wrong presentation. Hang on. <laughs> All right, let me stop. Let me go to 10. All right, I'm going to, sorry for this, I want to share my screen again. Why is it not doing that? All right, hang on, sorry. Get some more people in. I'm getting it out of, just gonna open it again. So apparently this does not want to work. All right, whatever, we're using this one. Okay, so there's my contact information. Uh, my name is Katie Kosas. I'm the Director of Financial Aid at my university. Um, you can set a phone number if you need to call us, and that's also my email if you need to reach out on anything, even if it's not to do with Niagara University, although I am representing them. What we're covering today is really just um, the basics of a financial aid um, patient that you need to know for any school that you're applying to. Okay, so the first thing that you really need to know um, is in order to start the FAFSA, you need to actually apply for your FSA ID. So you need one um, FSA ID for the student and then one for at least one of the parents. You can do both parents if you don't want to. We do sometimes encourage that just so um, if later down the road, one of the you know, parent two wants to actually apply for a parent plus loan, which we'll, we'll talk about later, um, you would need to have an FSA ID created in order for that to, um, to occur. So both parents don't need it, but we do recommend that at some point both do um, obtain FSA ID. One note is please be sure to use separate email addresses when you're doing this, whether it's for the student or the parents. Um, you cannot use the same one. If you do, it is going to mess things up um, immensely for both the students and um, trying to get everything signed. So if you don't have a separate email address, uh, please make sure that you do that as soon as possible um, and that you don't use the same one when creating your FSA IDs. This is just kind of a quick overview of the uh, that you'll go to uh, fsaid.ed.gov 
um, that you can do that right now, actually. You know, you don't have to wait. You can go ahead and do that. It can take a couple of days sometimes for this to process. It just depends if they're unable to kind of confirm all the information right away. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. Other times it might take a couple of days for everything to process. So it doesn't hurt to get a head start. Um, so once you have your FSA IDs, we'll then complete the FAFSA. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. Um, in order to do this, you do have to be a, a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen, like a permanent resident. Um, you are um, able to complete the FAFSA if you are not, um, like I said, either a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen, potentially for maybe any money from the institution themselves. Um, what we're going to go over today, I did actually in the chat, if you go to the chat, you'll see that I uploaded a, a copy of the on the web worksheet that you can download, um, as well as our financial aid for college booklet. Everything we talk about today is going to either be from the worksheet or in the booklet that was provided. So just make sure that when you get a chance, you download those to peruse and go over. It has all the websites that we're going to talk about in there. Um, so you will definitely have ability to view all those. On the fast on the web worksheet that we're going to go over, it's not something that's going to be mailed in. Um, it is breaking up. Okay. Um, hopefully, I know it's better, um, windy and rainy over here, so hopefully um, things will come through properly. If not, it is being recorded, so you will be able to view this again at another time as well. Um, if you do have any questions as we go along, I do recommend you put them in the chat. I did mute everybody just so there was no feedback, um, but if you um, would like to type in your question in the chat, we'll get to them as we go, um, or at the end, you can always unmute yourselves as well. Okay, so the FAFSA on the web worksheet, um, it is going to be, so I don't see anything that, if you go to the very, very beginning of the chat, you will be able to see the booklet, the PDF, and then the link I sent as well, and I can resend those later. Okay. So oh, the FAFSA on the web worksheet um, it is going to give you a general overview. It's not going to be every question you're going to have to answer when you go online. You don't mail this in. This is just for a preparation purposes. Um, for I assume everyone on the call is going to be um, a senior or is a senior right now going into their freshman year of college next year. And you'll be completing the 2122 FAFSA on the web form. It actually opens up tomorrow, October 1st. So this is perfect timing to have this so everyone is on the same page. So the first section of the worksheet is going to be the student's information. When you complete the FAFSA, it is the student's information. It's the student's FAFSA, so it is going to be completed on the basis of um, the student's information first. It is going to ask, like I said, if they're a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen. Um, if they, um, you know, if they're eligible non-citizen, you have to enter your alien registration number. It's also going to then ask if the student is single, um, married or remarried, separated, divorced or widowed. Typically, high school students are in the single category, of course. Um, so most likely, they would just have to answer um, that they're single and then move on to the next session. One thing I wanted to highlight is the selective service registration question. So if you are a male student and are 18 years um, old or older, you do have to sign up for the selective service in order to be eligible for any federal financial aid. This is something they talked about potentially, you know, doing away with at some point, not requiring this, but for the moment, it's still part of the process. So if you are a male student, 18 years or older, you would have to register for the selective service in order to be eligible for federal financial aid. If you're 17 when you're completing this, you won't have to at the moment, but just know in the following year, you would have to sign up for that. It's going to ask then um, who the um, parent one and parent two highest school completed. Please note that it's, um, classified as parent one or parent two, there's no mother or father. Um, so if you're putting, you know, mom down for parent one and dad down for parent two or vice versa, you just have to be consistent with that all the way through when you're reporting all the income information. It's then going to ask um, for the student's dependency status. It's going to ask a series of questions to see if the student is considered a dependent student or an independent student. As a dependent student, they would have to provide parental information. If they're considered an independent student, if they meet any one of these qualifications, then the FAFSA is just going to be based upon their information solely and not any parents. Um, if they were born before January 1st, 1998, if they're married, if they have children, if they're in the armed forces, if they're a veteran, if they're emancipated minor in legal guardianship, um, if they're homeless or in danger of being homeless, all of those um, are qualifications for a student being independent. Please note, though, 
that if a student does select that they're emancipated or are in legal guardianship, um, they will most likely have to provide additional documentation to the schools that they're applying to. Most schools will reach out and ask the student to provide legal court documentation to provide that. Unfortunately, some students get confused and kind of check that off incorrectly. Um, so it is something that most schools will ask for additional documentation for. So please be prepared to have that ready um, for when you're applying to different colleges. But for the most part, most students at this point coming out of high school are going to be considered a deep would have to provide information. A question I get asked quite often is, okay, um, which parents do I report? Well, if the parents, you know, biological parents are married, or if you're unmarried but living together, you're going to report both parents and both parents' incomes on the FAFSA. However, if the parents, biological parents are divorced, you would then report whoever the student lives with more than 50% of the time with during the prior 12 months. Another thing that comes up often is, okay, it's actually 50-50. Well, there's 365 days in the year, so it most likely cannot technically be 50-50, you know, but court orders or something says 50-50. Um, you would then go to whichever parent provides the most financial support to the student during those prior 12 months. Um, Typically, you know, parent with a higher income, you know, usually wins out, um, but that's how um, you should think about when you're completing the FAFSA for the parent. Something else to keep in mind is that if, you know, parents are divorced, and let's say student resides with mom, and mom is remarried, um, and now they're stepdad, you do have to report stepdad's information on the FAFSA, um, include him in the household, and include him in his income into the equation. Um, even if he might not be helping out um, in any college cost, it does not matter. You still have to report that information on the FAFSA. Now that you determine which parent goes on to it, um, or parents, you will then actually fill out the parent section. So again, parent one or parent two, um, father, mother, or step parent, whichever one. Again, just make sure you're being consistent in answering those questions. Don't switch up the data. Um, it's going to ask if the parents have completed their taxes um, for 2019 and to use those. So for the FAFSA that you're filling out for next year, it's going to be the 21-22 FAFSA, but you're using 2019 tax information. Um, if you've already, hopefully by now you've already completed your 2019 taxes. I know there were some extensions that were given out, of course, um, but hopefully by now all those are completed. If so, it's going to ask if you would like to use the IRS data retrieval tool. Um, what this does is that it actually takes the information that's on file with the IRS and places it, transfers it directly into the FAFSA form for the 21-22 year. We highly recommend that you do this. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it provides accurate information on the FAFSA. Uh, two, it's less things, um, less documentation potentially that you'll, you might have to provide down the road since you use the data retrieval tool. Um, and it just typically provides for a cleaner, faster form. Not as many mistakes happen that way. Now, not everyone can use the data retrieval tool. Um, if you are married um, but filed separately, you're unable to use it. Um, there's a couple other situations, but that's the main one. But for the majority of time, you are able to use that, and we do recommend you do so. When you when you do use the data retrieval tool, it will actually transfer over the um, adjusted gross income information, taxes paid, um, education credits those types of things, um, so you would not have to enter any of that information in. Please note, you won't actually be able to see any of the information that is transferred over, and that's for security reasons. So on the financial aid side, us counselors can see it, but um, students and parents would not be able to see the actual information that's being transferred over. I promise you, though, it is accurate and it is transferring over correctly. Um, one thing that you will have to enter in manually, though, is um, the actual wages. So although the AGI transfers over, the wages do not. You have to put those in. Again, parent one or parent two, wages for 2019. It's also going to ask if in 2019 or 2020, anyone in the household received Medicaid, SSI, SNAP, or food stamps, um, free or reduced lunch, TANF, WIC. Um, so if you did either in 2019 or 2020, you would check that box off. Um, and there's a lot of skip logic involved in, in the FAFSA, so you might not have to answer all of these questions, but these are the ones that would be present, uh, presented to you. It's also then going to ask, did, you, did the parents receive any of the following items in 2019? Um, so whether child, if you paid child support, if you have combat pay, um, if you received child support, if you had made any payments towards your 401k. Um, this is not the total amount of your 401k. This is just if any um, payments or deferments you know, went there from your paycheck during the 2019 year. And this 
actually be located on your W-2 form um, in box 12 in the specific codes. So if you received any one of those things, you would check, you know, put the, check that off and put in the actual amount um, from the specific forms. Now, at the very end, you will also notice that you might be asked about assets. Again, you might not have to based upon a lot of the skip logic that's put into the form, um, but you may have to provide information about assets. Um, it is based upon a combination of income information, number in household, number in college. So just kind of have those things ready um, if you are asked. If you are asked about it, um, to report our cash, savings, and checking accounts. Keep in mind that this is actually based on the current year, right as you're filing the FAFSA. So income information is based off of 2019, but the asset information is based off of whatever's in the account as of when you're filing the FAFSA. So cash savings, checkings, net worth of other investments, stocks and bonds, again, not your 401ks, but again, any other type of stocks or bonds you might have. Um, and then if you have a, net, a business or an investment firm, you would include the net worth of those as well. Um, then it goes on to the student section. Um, pretty much all the information that the parents had to complete prior now is on the students. Same questions are going to be asked. It's going to ask if the student filed a tax return in 2019, now, some might, some might not, because this is based upon two years ago information at this point. They might not have, you know, they were a sophomore in high school, might not have worked. If they didn't work, not a big deal. Just say that you're not going to file. Or if you did work but didn't earn enough to actually have to file, okay as well, but just make sure you put in whatever the wages were for that question. Again, they have the option of using the data retrieval tool as well if they file taxes in 2019. And again, we do highly recommend that you use that option. It will then also ask, um, again, in if the student received Medicaid, SSI, SNAP, any one of those, um, same questions as the parents. Now, something I didn't go over in here, um, but that is asked typically prior to all of this is the number in household. So it would be any parents um, and then any siblings, of course, and then any, and then the number that will be in college for the upcoming year. So this is only for the students though and their siblings. If you as a parent are in college, you unfortunately cannot count yourself as being in college on the student's FAFSA. It would be the student themselves and then any other siblings that might be attending college at the same time in the upcoming year. Same thing as the parents, they would be asked to, if they, you know, typically this doesn't really apply to most students coming out of high school, they don't have child support, they didn't receive any, they don't pay any, they don't have pension payments yet, none of that, um, but just know they are asked those same questions as well. And the assets they might be asked, and depending upon the uh, skip logic that is in place. So those are the main things that you're going to need um, when completing the FAFSA. I do recommend giving about 45 minutes to an hour the first time you go through this process, um, just to make sure that you're you know, going through all the questions, that you have all the information that you need, you have your W-2 forms, you have your taxes if necessary to complete all of the questions that are asked. Um, this is the website, FAFSA.gov. You can also go to studentaid.gov. They both take you to the same place. Um, and then this is where you would fill out, fill out the FAFSA form. If you've never been to this site before, don't have an account, you would go to the new user. Um, or if you're a returning student, or you know, returning user, you've completed it maybe for another student, um, or you're making a correction, you would go to the returning user section to log into there, it will then ask you, are you the student or are you the parent? And the only real difference for this um, is just how they are going to present the questions to you. It's just going to be how they phrase the questions, um, knowing whether you're the student who's logged in right now or if you're the parent who's logged in. I mentioned the data retrieval tool earlier. It is available to you starting tomorrow, and that's the same time that the FAFSA opens for the 21-22 year. Uh, they will, um, it, it does open tomorrow, I do suggest maybe waiting a couple of days after the first, only because the first day typically is just a bombardment of people logging on, trying to fill it out. Um, and so sometimes it slows the system down, sometimes it shuts down for a little bit. So please just maybe give it a couple of days and then feel free to go ahead and um, complete the FAFSA. Again, you should use the data retrieval tool when completing it. And this will just make the information that is provided much more accurate to schools so we can get you a, a better financial aid package um, based upon actual numbers rather than estimates. So after you complete the FAFSA, um, you will actually get the student aid report. Um, typically, this is emailed to the students um, it, with whatever email address that was provided on the FAFSA. Um, and what it is, is just really a summary of all the information that you just put on, <coughs> excuse me, into the FAFSA. So it will give you, um, 
you know, this is just kind of a snapshot of the first, uh, beginning of it, but we'll go through your question and show you the answer. So please review it, see if there's anything that needs to be corrected, and you can go back in and make those changes. You will have to give it about a week, though, um, in order to give it time to process, but you can go back in and make those changes. And just to note, um, right-hand side here, it says the data release number or the DRN. Uh, this is a four-digit number that is important to kind of keep track of because it, it allows other schools to um, view the information if perhaps you didn't add them on the FAFSA, and we'll get to that in a second. But it's a, a, a number um, to jot down to keep track of for that particular year. Other really big thing on here, um, in this case, the EFC is zero. Um, so that would be what schools use to put together financial aid packages. Um, it, you know, the asterisk. That actually means that the student has been selected for ver the verification process. And what that means is that the federal processor, the federal government, did select the student's FAFSA um, for verification. And that means that the school then has to collect additional information from the student and family um, to make sure that all the information that was completed on the FAFSA is correct. So um, we do have to, unfortunately, it is federal regulations that schools have to follow up on that. Um, so if you see that little asterisk, it does mean that you'll have to provide additional documentation to the schools that you're applying to. And then also notice on this C code. You don't really want to see a C code. That means that there is some with the FAFSA, a valid FAFSA. It might be due to citizenship. It might be due to the selective service. There's a lot of different reasons. Those are the, the two things for incoming students. Um, so if you see a C code, it means that some things aren't quite right. You have to go back in and fix something. The schools will probably contact you asking for additional documentation that you might have to provide. Other things that you can see on this report. In the FAFSA, you can actually list up the 10 schools um, that you want this to be sent to. Don't worry if you haven't been accepted to that school yet. That's perfectly okay. It'll be on file with them, and when you do get accepted, it would link up. Um, I know many students actually are applying to more than 10 schools, which is perfectly fine, but keep in mind that you can only have 10 schools at a time on the FAFSA. So what you would do is if you are, you know, need to add more than 10, you would complete the FAFSA the first time, put the 10 schools, you know, on um, that you would want to apply to first, submit it, wait about a week for it to process, go back in, you're going to, have to take some schools off and then add other schools. So it's really important that if you're doing this, that you're writing things down and knowing who's what schools on your FAFSA at what time. Because if you end up taking off a school, put on another one, but then end up going to that school you took off, they're not going to be getting any updates um, that you might do to your FAFSA and they won't be able to make as many corrections. So just keep track of that if you are applying to more than 10 schools. Um, after you submit the FAFSA, each school will receive the FAFSA electronically within three to five business days. Sometimes it only takes a couple of days. If there's a holiday involved, it'll take a little bit longer, um, but each school will receive that electronically. You are able to do the FAFSA on paper, but I don't recommend this. It takes so much longer. It'll take weeks for that to process as compared to just the three to five days tops if you do it electronically. Once the school does receive the FAFSA form, um, as long as you're an accepted student there, they'll start putting together your financial aid package. And then once they have the completed, they'll start sending out their award letters. It could be through mail, it could be through an email, through a portal, each school is very different. And you'll see a range of when you get those award letters. It could be in November, all the way through March, April, depending upon the school, depending upon when you're accepted. So don't freak out if you receive an award letter from one school in you know, December, but you, have, but you don't receive another one until you know, farther down the line, maybe March from another one. Um, just know that there will be that range. It all depends on the individual schools. Does anybody have any questions on the FAFSA form um, to ask before we kind of get into the other components? I'm just going to pull up the chat real quick. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll definitely get back to them um, after we get through, through the cost of attendance and the other um, slides. But yeah, feel free to type those in. Was, does taking the boxes for uh, food, so I'm assuming for food stamps, negatively impact the application? No, it does not. Um, it is just an indicator to um, the school. It's part of the actual the, the calculations. So if you are on, um, if you are receiving SNAP benefits, um, it actually helps to potentially reduce what your financial contribution might be, again, depending upon all of your other um, answers, your income and whatnot. So notice it does not negatively, negatively 
impact the application. The cost attendance and some of the different phrases you're going to hear a lot. So in financial aid, we have a ton of acronyms that we use um, just because we have so many different um, you know, phrases that we're working with. Um, and we don't always remember that not everyone knows what we're talking about. So I wanted to go over some of the common ones you're going to see as you go throughout the financial aid process throughout you know, the four years of, of um, college, um, two, four, six, whatever you're going for, um, you're going to hear these. So the cost of attendance, or the COA, as you're gonna, you might hear it, um, com is comprised of direct cost and indirect cost. Now, direct cost are those things such as tuition, fees, potentially books, maybe room and board if you're living on campus, anything that's charged directly to the student's account. The indirect cost would be transportation, personal cost, um, if you're not living on campus, a room and board um, component, and then um, potentially books and supplies as well if they're not charged directly to you. Each school is different. So both of those things combine to create what is called the cost of attendance. This can vary widely from college to college because each college's costs are very different. Uh, a, a state school is going to have a much lower cost of attendance as compared to a private uh, cost of attendance just typically due to tuition cost. So just keep in mind um, that you will see different cost attendances as you go along. Um, it is important to note that by regulation, a financial aid officers are not, or offices are not actually able to award you any money above and beyond the cost of attendance. So this typically comes into play when parents and students are taking out additional loans. They might take out an additional loan for, I don't know, let's say $20,000. Um, but maybe your cost of attendance is only 15. So we are um, unable to put that full amount of that private loan on. That's typically when you'll, you'll see that come into play, but just uh, keep that in mind that there's only a certain amount of financial aid that we can uh, award and the maximum would be up to your cost of attendance. Now I already touched on this before with the FAFSA form, is your expected family contribution or your EFC. This is the amount based upon those calculations, all the information you put into the FAFSA, um, is going to um, combine uh, to produce a financial uh, EFC um, that is it's a standard number that each of the schools use to put together a financial aid package for students. Um, it does say the same regardless of college, whether you're going to a state school, a private school, Harvard, wherever, um, the EFC does stay the same. It's two components, the parents and the students, as I said, from all the information you put on the FAFSA, and it is calculated using that federal application um, that you completed. It is really important to note, um, I'm actually gonna go back. It's really important to note that even though you might have a zero EFC saying that you know, you're reasonably expected to be able to contribute zero dollars towards the, the education, that does not necessarily mean that is what your balance is going to be. So potentially if you're going to like a state school here in New York and you get full TAP and full Pell, we'll get into those awards and then later down the road, um, you might not owe anything, that's entirely possible. But typically at a private school, um, you would be expected to have some type of contribution, have some type of balance um, at, the, at private schools. So just because your EFC is zero, or just because it's maybe 5,000 or 10,000, does not mean that that is exactly what your balance is going to be. It's just pretty much a standard way for offices to be able to put together financial aid packages for students. Okay, on to the next one. So financial need. This is something you're gonna hear a lot. Oh, that's a need-based grant. That's a need-based award. Well, how do you know if I have financial need? So how we know um, is we take your cost of attendance and then we minus away your expected family contribution from the FAFSA form and that remaining number is your financial need. And what that means is that schools can award financial aid, need-based aid, up to that amount. We cannot go over it um, based upon this calculation. Some of the types of financial aid that you're going to see in a financial aid package once you start receiving those award letters, whether in, in the mail or through email, um, First, you have your scholarships and your grants. Free money, don't pay those back, definitely want those, of course. These could be such things um, from the university or the college. It could be, for, um, whether it's based upon merit scholarships, or it could be need-based grants, it could be Pell grants from the federal government. All those things based upon, not always based upon need, but they don't have to be paid back. Always a good thing, of course. The next two things we call the self-help aid. Um, these are things, like the loans, they are in the, you know, typically in the student's name, unless you're getting a parent loan or private loan. They have to be repaid back after graduation or after the student stops attending at least um, part-time. Or employment. It could be a work-study job on campus or it could be some other type of student employment. Um, so they would, it's an award, but they do have to work for it in either to, you know, to earn the money to, for a paycheck 
or to put toward their student account. So the first two things, free money, the second two things, loans and employment, you either have to pay it back or you have to work for it in order to, to receive the money. Sources of financial aid that you're going to see, the largest source is the federal government. Um, that covers, that's again, derived from the FAFSA form. You have to fill out the, that FAFSA form in order to see if you're eligible for anything. Um, then there's the states. If you're a New York State re resident attending a New York State school, you might be eligible for some of the New York State awards. We'll get into more detail on that. Private sources, this is pretty much anything that's not through the federal government, the state government, or the institution. Um, it could be a community foundation of Greater Buffalo. I know they have a, a ton of scholarships that are available. It could be the Lions Club, American Legion, um, employers, Wedmans has scholarships for their students or their employees, I should say. So all those sources that kind of need to be, you know, sought out on, on the student's behalf um, that would be able to go towards their education. So those are the main things that you'll see within those financial aid packages. Federal government, as I said, largest source of financial aid. It is a, a aid that's through the federal government is a, primarily awarded on the basis of financial need. So again, that calculation that we did based off of your financial contribution um, would really drives what type of aid you would be eligible for. You do have to apply for this every single year. So you might be really excited to kind of get that FAFSA done, um, you know, for the first year, but it is something you have to do every single year in order to be eligible for any of the federal aid. And typically, sometimes a lot of the institutional aid as well is derived from the FAFSA calculations. Um, so the good news, though, is that after the first time you complete the FAFSA, it gets a lot easier because it's just a lot of renewal information. You don't actually have to go in and, you know, put in all the basic information again. You just have to update the income, number and household, those types of things. So some of the common, most common federal aid programs that you'll see in those financial aid packages are listed below. There's the federal Pell Grant. That is an entitlement. So that is based solely off of your financial contribution from the FAFSA. Right now, I believe the cutoff is about 5,200. So if your EFC is about 5,200 or below, you would be Pell Grant eligible. And that Pell Grant ranges, it can be a couple hundred dollars all the way up to about $6,300 for the year. Um, I often get asked if there's an income cutoff for that. There's no specific income cutoff. It's based off of solely the EFC from the FAFSA, which is based off of that calculation of income, assets, number in household, number in college. Then there's the TEACH grant. Um, this one is specifically for students going into the education uh, field. You have to, there's certain majors you have to be in within education. You have to be go, um, planning to teach at a, a high needs field, in a high needs field down the road. So there's additional things you have to complete for that. It is something you might want to look into with whatever colleges you're applying to. Just note that if you do not, if you receive the grant and then you end up not being able to fulfill the requirements down the road, it does turn into an, a loan. Um, pretty much unsubsidized loan where all the interest kind of goes, you know, starts to be calculated from the very beginning. So got to be really sure that you're going to complete those requirements. Otherwise, it does turn into a loan. There's the opportunity grant. Um, this one, you do have to be Pell Grant eligible. Unlike the Pell Grant, where if you're eligible for it, you get it regardless of anything else. The opportunity grant, you might technically be eligible for it, but each school has a very limited amount of money that they can award through this program. So it, you might not see this in your financial aid package, um, just not because of lack of eligibility, but more so just because there's just not enough of that fund to go around to everyone, depending upon the school, of course. Then there's federal work study. This is a federal program. You do have to have a financial need in order to, in order to be eligible for the work study program. Um, a student typically works on campus or maybe you know in the local area. Here at Niagara, um, typically students, our students work between 10 to 12 hours a week, and they can either put that money towards their account or they can take a paycheck every two weeks like a normal job. The next two things are loans. So if you're subsidized and unsubsidized loans. Subsidized means that it's a need-based loan. It means that the government pays the interest on the loan while the student is in school. Um, and the unsubsidized, the government does not pay the interest. So it is accruing uh, while students are in school. The good news right now, though, is that interest rates are super low this year. They're hovering just above 2%. Um, so it's not a bad time right now to take out these loans um, as they are you know, very low interest right now. Um, they, again, are loans, so they do have to be paid back after graduation or if the student stops attending at least part-time um, for the year or during any semester, actually. Um, and then there are limits on how much you can have each year. So for the subsidized loan uh, and unsubsidized, for the combination of those for the freshman year, it's 5,500, goes to 6,500 for the sophomore year. And then for the junior and senior years, you can have $7,500 each year. So there are limits on those. The last thing federal program I wanna talk about is the PLUS loan. 
This is a federal loan, but it's actually in the parent's name. So it's a parent plus loan. Um, it is something that parents can apply for using their FSA ID, um, which I talked about earlier. They can apply for this. Very quick application, doesn't take very long to complete. It's honestly just based pretty much solely on credit score. Um, if you have a decent credit score, you would get approved. Um, and then you could take out the loan for the amount that you requested or up to the maximum cost of attendance, whichever you choose. Um, if the parents, the interesting thing about this is that if the parent gets denied for this loan, um, again, you find out within like five minutes, the school gets notified the next day. If the parent gets denied, the student will then actually receive an additional unsubsidized loan in the amount of $4,000 for the year. So this is something interesting to consider if maybe you only have a little bit of that balance left um, and the parent you know, is looking to get denied, that student would then get an additional unsubsidized loan of $4,000 for the year to help pay off the balance. Um, states. So um, as I did mention before, if you're a New York State resident attending a New York State school, you cannot go to a school outside of New York um, to receive these grants and scholarships. Uh, you might be eligible for some state-based aid. Um, it, it's both based upon need and uh, merit. There's not a ton of merit scholarships out there through New York State, but there's some. But most of it, uh, majority of it, is the need-based award. So this would be like the TAP uh, program, tuition assistance program through New York State. This is the most popular program um, that students can apply for. It, there isn't a specific income cutoff for this, however. Um, so it will be based upon a combination of parent and student New York State net taxable income. If that is below $80,000 for the 2019 year, then you would be eligible for a TAP grant. The TAP grant can range from $500 for the year all the way up to about $5,100 for the year. Um, again, combination of student and parent for that uh, 2019 tax year based upon New York State information. It does use information from the FAFSA. So at the very end of the FAFSA, when you complete it, after you hit submit, it's gonna say, congratulations, you've submitted your FAFSA. It will be then a little link right underneath and it will say, would you like to transfer your information um, to your state application? I highly recommend saying yes and doing it right then and there, because if you do that, it will take the information directly that you already completed on the FAFSA and put it right into your New York State application. There's a few other questions you'll have to answer, but the majority of it will be transferred over. Um, it's a little extra time, but it does save a lot of time in the end, because if you don't fill it out at that time, it's still okay, but you have to wait for the FAFSA to process for about a week, then go directly to the state website, which is um, hesk.ny.gov, it's in the booklet that um, I sent around. Um, you would have to go there directly and then fill it out from scratch. So re-input, you know, re-inputting all the information you already did for the FAFSA um, that you would have to then complete for the state. So again, recommend doing it right after you um, complete the FAFSA, but you know, sometimes you don't have the time, sometimes it might bomb out on you um, when you're online. So understandable, um, just make sure you go back and to complete that um, application for the state. The other um, program that I get asked a lot of questions on through the state is the Excelsior or the Enhanced Tuition Award ETA program. Um, the Excelsior program, this is for if you're attending a state university or a community college within New York State. Um, if your parents and students adjusted gross income from 2019 is $125,000 or less, you um, would be eligible to receive the Excelsior program, which for state schools is free tuition minus any TAP grant that you, that you received and Pell Grant as well. So in fact, you might already be receiving full tuition um, at the schools between your TAP and Pell, but if you're not, then you might be eligible for the Excelsior program. Please note that there are a lot of conditions that you have to meet each semester. Each semester, students have to be making academic progress. You have to be completing 15, at least 15 credits per semester. Um, if you get off track, there's no getting back on. Um, you do have to live there's um, residency requirements after graduation. So for how many, let's say you receive the grant for four years, um, after graduation, you'd have to stay in New York State for four years. Otherwise, it turns into a loan. It is an interest-free loan, so that's good, but it would turn into a loan. Um, so just some things to keep in mind. Um, please read. There's a contract you have to fill out. Uh, go to the New York State website, review all the information um, and before you decide to apply for that. Um, there has been talk, uh, someone asked me in the last night's presentation, of will the income increase above 125,000? I know there was a proposal to increase it to either 130 or 135, but I don't believe that has been passed yet. Um, and then as far as the, that's for, so that's for state schools. As for the enhanced tuition award, which is the private school version of this, of the Excelsior Scholarship, it is not free tuition. It is capped at $6,000 minus any TAP grant that you're receiving, but all the other same um, policies and criteria apply. Please note, though, 
that not every private school, actually there's not, um, it seems to be dwindling as each year goes by, um, actually participate in this in the ETA program. It's a voluntary program that the schools can choose to elect into. So not every, not every private school does it. Um, at Niagara we did for a couple of years, but um, the re requirements for the students and the timing of when the funds came in, it was just not really benefiting our students that much. So we have decided not to do it for the past couple of years. Um, but so you, there is a list on the state website of all the private schools that do participate. So please check that out if you are interested in that. Okay, moving on. So, um, another thing I like to talk about is private sources. Please, please, please apply, look, search for um, outside private scholarships. Even $500 helps, whether it's $500 or $6,000. And I've seen the $6,000 amounts come in from our Community Foundation of Greater Buffalo that's in the, our local area. It helps. Um, you might have to write an essay. Uh, you might have to, you know, maybe submit some additional documentation to the whatever that they're asking for. Please take the time to do this. You can start researching these now. Typically, applications for outside sources open from, you know, January to March, April-ish. Um, just start looking. I know Canton has, I was looking on their website, and you guys have some scholarships listed on there as well, so that may, might be specific to students at Canton, so please try looking at that if you can. Um, look at the schools you're applying to. They might know of some outside private ones or even ones within the, the schools themselves that they might have that you might not know about. Um, just please take the time to do this. When I was a student in my senior year, I did not want to do this. Trust me, I didn't. I was like, I don't have time for that. I have other things going on. Well, now that I'm on the other side of things, I see how much money some of our students get. It's crazy. It's, it's good for them. But now I regret not doing some of those essays and some of those applications because, again, even $500 helps for books. Um, Wegmans, I always like to use Wegmans because I know that they do give scholarships to their employees. Um, so it doesn't hurt to ask whoever you're employed at um, if they might have, um, you know, scholarships or benefits available. This, of course, has dwindled over the years. Back in the day, there was a lot more that would um, have that ability. Not so much these days, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And the one thing I wanted to end on is special conditions and appeals. Um, we know things change, especially right now with COVID and um, you know unemployment and reduction of income that has been happening. Things are not the same as they were in 2019. Um, so if your income or your situation has changed, it could be uh, again, a loss of a job, a reduction in income, um, perhaps a divorce situation, um, or heaven forbid someone has passed away um, since the 2019 year, because that is what the FAFSA is based upon, 2019 tax year. Please contact the schools that you're applying to and that you're really interested in um, to do this. You might not, if you're applying to 10, you might not want to do every school. I'd only do the ones that you're, you know, truly, truly interested in and thinking of going to. Um, contact them, explain the situation. We might be able to do what we call professional judgment. Um, and this is typically something where the school is able to use the current year information, um, depending upon when it is, or maybe it's 2020 information or, you know, in the future. Um, they'd be able to use that information instead of 2019, and we would do an override or professional judgment. Now, sometimes, Nothing really has changed, but you just know that you are going to need some additional funding in order to be able to attend the school. So it does not hurt at all to contact the school's financial aid office or admissions office and you know, explain, hey, I just, you know, I got my package and I'm comparing it to this other school and I just need a little bit extra money. It does not hurt to do that whatsoever. Um, the, the worst thing, you know, we can do is say no. Um, right now, schools are, of course, are, are wanting students to come, so they, we are willing to work with students and parents, of course. Um, so it doesn't hurt to ask. The worst they can say is no. I will say typically, of course, um, state schools don't have, you know, a ton of extra endowments and whatnot um, to always give something, but this is um, definitely private schools. You would be able to do this. You might be asked to provide some additional documentation. Of course, if there's a, 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 a income change or something like that, you would be asked to provide that additional documentation. Um, but sometimes, if you're comparing, you know, one school to another, you might be asked to provide that other school's award letter so that we can, the schools um, can actually kind of do an apples to apples comparison to see what's going on. Um, so don't be shy about doing that. We, we we are used to it, especially the past couple of years, more and more. Okay. Um, that does wrap up my main presentation. Um, please let me know. You can um, put the questions in the in the chat box um, or unmute the, your, yourselves as we go along. My contact information is here again if you do have any questions. Whether it's about Niagara or not, we are happy to help um, answer any of those um, basic FAFSA questions you might have or if something's just not making sense, we'd be happy to help go over all that with you. 
sorry, my voice, <laughs> I'm losing my voice. Um, okay, let me see if there was any questions. Um, so one of the questions is, is there a scholarship for STEM programs for the top 10% students? Yes, there is a STEM scholarships um, through New York State that the student would have to apply for directly through them. Um, and then they would actually select the students. Like at Niagara, I know I've only seen a few come in. I think they, they only take a few students for private schools each year. Um, but yes, there are STEM scholarships. Um, just know that the money doesn't actually get paid until after the semester is over. Um, so you might kind of have to maybe pay that money up front and then maybe get reimbursed. Um, we have to wait until grades are in in order to actually certify students for that. Um, but yes, you can apply for the STEM scholarships through New York State. Yeah, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen. Um, okay. And let me go back to the chat. Okay, so Kenton is offering free lunches to all students right now while we're at home. If we pick that up, should we check the box at the school that received free lunch in 2019 2020, even if we didn't qualify for free reduced lunch when um, students were in the schools? Yes, yeah, you can still. Um, check off that box. Um, it doesn't necessarily always come into play. Um, it's going to also be based upon the income information you have. Um, but yes, you can certainly check off that box if you are receiving it right now. You're welcome. Okay, feel free to, like I said, pop into questions. Um, if you need me, this is being recorded, so um, I will actually probably shut off recording it in a, in a minute here, and you can still ask me questions, but I will send the link over so you can view it again. Um, and then, again, feel free to reach out if you guys have any questions moving forward. So, um, um, Matt, or did you, get, did you need to say anything else before we, any questions for me? Um, well, thank you so much from, um, from Kenton, this is so helpful. And I just wanted to say everyone should also check out Niagara University. There's, it's a beautiful campus, it's, it's close by, um, and it's a great school to go to. So everyone should do a virtual visit or, or see if there's a way to visit in person. Well, thanks for that plug, because I didn't even think of saying that, so thank you. <laughs> um, another question I had, uh, does it matter if I use the Federal Student Aid app or the website online? No, yeah, I, I always forget to mention that there's actually the app on the phone you can download into the FAFSA that way. No, that does not matter. Um, it used to be that you couldn't use the data retrieval tool if you use the app, but they, they fixed that. So yes, you should be able to use the app. Um, it might be a little bit more um, harder to kind of get some of the help questions because I know like that um, it'll, if you have a question on a specific field, oh, I don't know, you know, what box to, you know, have this from, it might be a little bit harder to figure that out on the phone as compared to the website, but no, you can do it either on the website or through the app, um, either one is fine. I want to stop recording, but feel free to keep on um, popping in those questions and I'll be on for a little bit longer.